I think the future of the moon is a routine, regular access to the moon. same way that we're talking about hotels for private citizens in space. Hotels on the moon? It will be a little while, but I think that's a possibility sometime in the future. The future is unfolding at Astrobotics headquarters in Pittsburgh. Inside this vast facility, researchers are laying the groundwork for a reality once limited to science fiction, human life on the moon. Hair mask on? Hair mask on. One size fits all? There's a few different sizes. A small is too big for me. We all ready? All right. <laughs> Astrobotics ambitions are driven by CEO John Thornton. His lifelong vision taking shape inside a clean room so secure, few outside the company are allowed in. That is the largest lander of any kind since Apollo, as you're seeing right ah. there. It's going to deliver a 1,000 pound rover that NASA's building called Viper to the pole of the moon to drill for water. Space landers built here will carry the load for the lunar economy, shuttling cargo from the Earth to the moon. The amount of precision required and the amount of engineering that's required to get every gram of performance out of this vehicle, <laughs> it's tremendous. The Peregrine Lander marks the first real test for astrobotics technology. It's housed inside the most secure confines of its facility. We're walking into a, an area that has less than 10,000 parts per million in, in dust and debris in the air. So we need to be very, very clean to make sure that our dry skin or our hair or any, any debris that comes from us doesn't end up on the spacecraft. The Peregrine is engineered with its own electronics, propulsion, and communication systems. The vehicle will be loaded onto a ULA Vulcan rocket. If it lands successfully, it would mark the first commercial lunar landing in history, beating out their primary competitor, Japan's iSpace. You talked about Astrobotics' mission being, you know, sort of democratizing access to the moon. Why is it so difficult to get there? First, you've got to build the spacecraft here on Earth. You've got to uh, get it up into space. That's relatively easy now, especially with the likes of the rise of commercial launch uh, uh, groups like SpaceX, for example, making access to space affordable and routine. But the next big challenge is when you go out to the moon is you, you have to build a spacecraft that can fly for up to a month or more at a time through space, get out to the moon, uh, drop into lunar orbit, and then descend for a soft landing down on the surface. No private group has so far been successful to land on the surface themselves. Um, we hope to be the first. Success on that initial landing will pave the way for Astrobotics' next phase, building out the moon's infrastructure. It's part of a $470 billion global industry, largely dominated by the U.S. While satellites and rockets have attracted a bulk of the space investments, infrastructure spending is growing. Most people think of space as, as NASA and the government agencies, but less than 20% of that $470 billion is actually government activity. So the, the rise of commercial space is thriving right now and only projected to continue to grow. And the moon is going to play a very important part of that. Playing in that space requires navigating the moon's extremes. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. That light you see there is what they call Earth shine. It's essentially the reflection of the light through the Earth's atmosphere. And that really bright light you see back there is the sunlight. And they do this to make sure that their software can operate in these conditions. The lighting conditions in space are very challenging. There's no atmosphere that will diffuse the light and make it change directions and kind of even it out. And dark in space is very dark. Like there's zero light reflected around. The tests are done to ensure these robots can navigate the lunar surface in spite of that. This one known as Cube Rover is designed to carry payloads across challenging terrain filled with tiny particles known as moon dust. So this is pretty similar to what we know as regolith, which is on the lunar surface. And I mean, it kind of feels like sand. One of the biggest issues on the moon is the dust. Um, it's almost talcum powder-like uh, sized. It's, it's very sticky. It's very uh, electrostatically charged. It sticks to stuff like static. 
and that can get on all kinds of things and cause all kinds of problems. To address that, Jay Eckerd's teams built a wireless charger that can operate even with a moon dust storm, giving rovers and landers a direct source of power. So the expectation is that you, you take this to the moon, you're going to get all the regolith in there, but you want to make sure that it's still transferring power. That's right, because if you run out of power on the moon, that's game over. You don't get to go up there and plug it in or, or you know, bring it extra batteries. To ensure reliable access to power, Astrobotics also building out a portable grid that provides solar energy. This Luna grid will act as a type of mini gas station, generating and distributing power. That's especially critical during the lunar night, which spans 14 days. It gets down to liquid nitrogen cold for two weeks and that kills a lot of spacecraft. So if you can survive that night, you can then do multiple year-long uh, expeditions on the surface of the moon. It's a future Astrobotic is working closely with NASA on. The company secured multiple contracts valued at $450 million. Next year, this Griffin lander is set to carry NASA's own rover, Viper, as part of the Artemis mission. That robot will be tasked with looking for a water in the deepest craters of the moon. If they're successful, Thornton says it will open the floodgates for space exploration. So water at the poles of the moon could be like oil it was here on Earth for, for the beginnings of our space travel. So that could be how we go back and forth from the moon. That could be how we refuel our spacecraft to go to Mars and other deep space destinations nations, but it all starts right here with our nearest neighbor, the moon. That 240,000 mile journey from the Earth to the moon, unlocking a new vision that could propel humans into the next frontier.